gentleman from Texas, Mr. Cloud. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here. This is certainly one of the most urgent matters that we are dealing with. I, I find it odd that as we watch the news very often, it's not that they're lying, although that sometimes that's the case. It's just we're not talking about things that are essentially important and things that are going to matter 20, 30 years from now where this topic certainly will and how we address it. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Chair, for, for hosting this. Uh, Dr. Thayer, I think it was you who talked about this is the greatest shift in American power uh, that we've seen transferring to to the east. Uh, this was predicted, actually, the U.S. National Intelligence Council in November of 2008 released a report, and they do this periodically, as I'm, I'm sure you all know. But they said, the unprecedented shift in relative wealth and economic power roughly from west to east is now underway and will continue. They said, the United States in relative strength, even in military realm, will decline and the U.S. leverage will become more and more constrained. In terms of size, speed, and directional flow, the transfer of global wealth and economic power now underway, roughly from east to west, is happening without precedent in modern history. And it went on and it explained why it was happening. It said it's happening for two reasons. One, we're sending manufacturing overseas and we're sending oil and gas revenues overseas. Um, and, and yet it seems like we have not changed course when the prescription was there as it addressed the problem that we continue to send uh, overseas. And you also called this a Cold War. Uh, I've read Unrestricted Warfare. I, I know a lot of people have, but, you know, the, the different ways that they talk about providing warfare, and this isn't even a com comprehensive list. Of course, they list the traditional ones as well. Uh, Mr. Axon, you mentioned on some of these uh, trade warfare, network warfare, biological warfare, biochemical, resource uh, warfare. I think of what's going on at, at our border and even how they're uh, they're taking advantage of what's happening at the border and causing us to use resources, not to mention what they're getting across our border uh, in the ways of fentanyl and military age single adults that are coming across our border, economic aid, uh, warfare, regulatory warfare, smuggling, drug warfare, uh, electronic space. It, it just goes uh, on and on. It, they even said, uh, as part of that, they said, can special funds be set up to exert greater influence on another country's government? and legislature through lobbying, could buying or gaining control of stocks be used to turn another country's newspapers and television stations into tools of media warfare? I mean, they, they are in a no holds bar, all but collateral, it seems, warfare against the United States. And so it seems like we have to be, first of all, recognize the moment, and I know that you all do. I think you're here bringing some awareness to that. But I haven't felt like this is, like we, our government and certainly our State Department has felt that. I was wondering, uh, Mr. Say yeah. Did I say it right? Sella, uh, Mr. Sella, if uh, if you could explain to me what you've seen in regards of our State Department and what you think we should be doing to to counter what we're seeing coming from China. Certainly. Thank you for the question, sir. I uh, I would say that we are where we are. I would say that after the Cold War, 1993, we kind of pulled up ten sticks. End of history. Uh, I would say it could be symbolized in the Indo-Pacific with uh, closing of our embassy in the Solomon Islands. China had been in that realm in the late 80s uh, doing Ill, uh, irregular things. They had uh, approval by UNESCO to put a uh, tide monitoring station, a fiery cross reef. What's a fiery cross reef now? A 10,000 foot runway, deep uh, water port. Um, some suggest some uh, missile armaments as well. So we, they've, they've done a lot in a, in a, in a a period of time where, again, obviously our Ken shifted to the Middle East and our engagements there, uh, but we have a lot of time to make up for, um, and I think it is imperative for really all the interagency State Department to uh, provide information and education to the public at large. It's a whole of society, whole of government engagement, and I think one uh, element I think that is lacking within the Foreign Service Institute, for instance, would be to have a segment, a section, uh, uh, on uh, political warfare, what it is, I mean, to marinate in what, who the CCP is, who General Secretary Xi Jinping is, what their objectives are, and what they can do uh, before they head out to post and uh, what they need to do when they're at post. When, when I've talked to leaders and ambassadors from other countries, I've heard this often from different continents, even from, from different leaders, and they, they say, right now, obviously, we love the United States, it's history of freedom, we want to align ourselves to that. But when we talk to China, 
we hear about roads, bridges. When we talk to our State Department, we get a lecture. Uh, and, and it's social reengineering, you know, in many cases, values that really aren't embraced in their country. Uh, and it, it's not really about creating a relationship or certainly projecting American interest. Uh, do you have anything to say to that? I, do, I would say just in terms of back to the Foreign Service Institute, uh, an understated tool I think that we really should build on that I found useful when I was at Post, we're u using our Judeo-Christian roots as a country and use it as a means of outreach in terms of soft power and engagement with our, our host countries. That has a mighty impact. China doesn't do that. They don't know how to do it. Right. It's not here and not there. So that is that has to be compl complemented, I think, by some very meaningful engagements. I, I, I think uh, the uh, COFA, for instance, one material way, I, I guess, that when I was there, this is an appeal from other windswept uh, nations that I was accredited to, uh, uh, suffering. Again, there, there's great affinity for us. There's great comity to us. They, we fought for them, bled for them, died for them in World War II. Uh, would to have been to extend COFA to include countries such as Nauru and Kiribati, who within the last five years have shifted allegiance from Taiwan to Beijing. I see my time's expired. But. Gentlemen, time's expired. Chair, now recognize Ms. Norton.